All right, so welcome to UVA's Orthopedic uh, Residency Program's virtual curriculum. Tonight will be the sports division highlighted. Um, and so, like I told you before, or last week during our sort of orientation thing, um, we are going to highlight a division each time around. Uh, this time is the sports division. We'll do our PEDS division, adult reconstruction division, trauma division throughout the entire nine week block. So the goal of this is for you guys to all get a pretty good sense of kind of who we are and kind of how our program is made up and how your rotations will work when you're on this, uh, in this program and also just get you introduced to our faculty. So um, again, tonight will be the sports division. Tim Lancaster from our PGY threes is going to uh, finish it off just talking about the hospital and kind of giving you guys a virtual tour. So without further ado, I want to introduce my division real quick. Um, so clearly the best division in, in all of UVA orthopedics, perhaps the world. Um, it's, you know, it's debatable, but I think it's pretty strong. Just introduce you to everybody. And maybe if you're on the call, you can say hello. Um, so Mark Miller, are you here? Can you wave your hand? Yeah, hello. So Dr. Miller is my senior partner. And obviously he's, he's one of the most well-known orthopedists probably in the world. Runs Miller Review course, Miller Review of Orthopedics. He's a complex knee surgeon, also does a lot of shoulder surgery as well. Really one of the top educators that I know and really is one of the best mentors I know too. He's a big time leadership radio with the STEM um, and really just a rock star when it comes to being not only an academic orthopedist, but a researcher and just an all around great guy. Loves to drink some dark water too. So here's Steve Mark Miller. There you go, back at you. So Steve Brockmeyer showed up. Good job, Steve, you got off your ICL. Yep, just made it. So Steve is, uh, Steve is my partner as well. He helps take care of UVA, UVA uh, um, sports. He does complex shoulder and knee. Um, really does a lot of arthroplasty and, and instability work in the shoulder and some really complex cuff stuff. Um, in a leadership role at AOSSM as well. He runs the education committee there. Um, all around good guy. He's a great guy to be uh, a partner to as, as well as be a men you know, he, he mentors a lot of residents as well. Um, Dave Deduck, are you here? Yep, hello. So Dr. Deduck is the tallest of the crew, as you can see, he has a, probably the best head of hair. <clears throat> In this picture, I had hair and now I don't, so that's what happens when you're a faculty for orthopedics, but Dr. <laughs> Deduck is, has been the head team position for UVA Sports for, you know, for a couple, you know, for at least over a decade, and uh, is a complex knee surgeon, really loves patellofemoral work, and uh, has gotten really, really found his groove with trochleoplasty and, and with the patella femoral work. Also, does a lot of shoulder stuff and just general sports as well. Um, a lot of leadership stuff in AOSSM too. Uh, world class guy when it comes to teaching and, and research and, and um, taking care of teams. Great, just a cosmic team position. Brian Warner, he'll be giving our talk. Where's Brian? Hi. So, Brian is actually my junior partner, but he, he, he's here to me in most ways. One, he is probably the most prolific researcher that we have. Over 200 peer review articles. Um, he's the head team doctor at James Madison University, and he does everything complex. No matter what comes in, Brian takes care of it. He'll do complex knee, complex shoulder, uh, whatever. He'll take it all. Um, but a great Not hips. Was that? Hit. No hips. Yeah, that's where, come, that's where I come in. So I'm Winston Guathmi, the best looking of the crew. Uh, probably, probably the least uh, achieved, but um, I, I am uh, the program director. I, I love education, as you guys might figure out. Um, I do shoulder, hip, and knee. I'm the only guy here who's dumb enough to do hips, uh, primarily because that's the only way I can get a job here. But it has been a nice niche, and I'll try to teach you guys how to make hip fun. So that's my division. Just want to say hello to everybody. Thank you all for being here, and they'll each be running a room. So Keith Bachman is also here. He's going to be our student sports faculty for the night. He's going to help run a room, too. He's also a sporty. Um, but he takes care of kids mainly, so especially his kids. All right, so just our division, uh, basically cover every element of sports surgery. We are the busiest service at UVA by volume. Uh, basically, our caseload is much heavier than the other uh, service. That's why we uh, have the most resident and fellow coverage because we just have a lot of fun stuff to do. We are the team docs for UVA, James Madison University, and basically every area high school there is around here. Uh, academically very productive, um, just tons of papers, tons of podiums. Um, Mark Miller has an empire of, of productivity when it comes to his books and, and his research and his review courses. Uh, we are the you know, faculty for national courses, AOSSM, AOS, um, ANA, uh, Herodicus, maybe different national uh, organizations we are uh, a part of. Again, leadership roles as well. And, and we like to be lifelong mentors or resident fellow alumni. I can't, I can't tell you how many times the phone rings for Mark or Dave or, or Steve 
uh, when it's one of our alumni, alumni who's you know, struggling with the, the knee case or something like that, just needs some advice. And so that's who we are and that's what we like to do. As far as our rotation, we have re three residents on sports in a given moment. Uh, there are three 10 week rotations or PGY two, three, and five. There's also the opportunity to participate in sports cases while you're in Roanoke. We have three orthopedic sports fellows, which I think is actually a huge advantage because you, you get a chance to kind of see some different perspectives and have some year peer uh, learning and mentorship. There's so much many cases, it's usually one-to-one -one coverage in the OR and the clinic, so you're, you're spread all over the place. We do a lot of arthroscopy labs. You also have the opportunity to take care of high school teams whenever there's not a worldwide pandemic. And additionally, more residents from our program pursued sports best than any other sports special at UVA. You know, recently we've sent folks to Rush, Vail, HSS, you know, wherever. We currently have graduates at Vail and, and UNC right now. Uh, Michelle, who, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, but she's going to HSS next year. We're trying to figure out where Matt Heath is going to go. So we've got a bunch of PGY3s interested in sports. So that's pretty much all I got. So I'm going to turn the podium over now to my partner, Brian Werner, uh, so we can talk about shoulder instability. If I could ask for a couple, uh, um, just some housekeeping stuff. If you guys could put your full name onto your uh, onto your thing, that would make my life a lot easier so I can kind of keep track of who's here. So I also got to get you guys out to your um, different breakout rooms later. I sent you guys some assignments. They might not be that per like there's some people who have dropped off the list. So if you're not in the room you thought you'd be in, sorry about that. You'll be okay. All right, Brian, the floor is yours. Go for it, my friend. All right. Can you hear me okay, Winston? Yeah, you sound great. Perfect. Um, you, you sounded great. I, I, you just couldn't handle it, so you had to mute me. Um, anyway, um, so this is a talk that I made to try to just summarize uh, anterior shoulder instability. Um, there's a case in the groups also for, um, you know, the shoulder, posterior shoulder instability, but um, to try to take 10 or 15 minutes just to kind of summarize what you need to know about anterior shoulder instability. Let's see advancing slide. So I'll start with a case is different than the case that's in your, um, in the discussions later. Um, so just kind of a representative case for anterior shoulder instability. So this is a 17 year old right hand dominant. He's a senior in high school. Um, he had initial traumatic dislocation during a, an April game. He plays lacrosse. Um, he had to go to the emergency room to have it reduced and then subsequently had three additional instability events. Um, it's his dominant arm. We'll talk a little bit about all these examination maneuvers during the, the subsequent slides, but um, he had apprehension on exam, he had a positive Job test, and, and no evidence of generalized ligamentous laxity. Um, these are kind of typical radiographs that we like to get. So you want to get in the upper left a, a good AP view or grashy view of the shoulder. Um, where you can see the joint really well. You can um, kind of look at the shape of the glenoid. You can look at the, the various space around the shoulder. Make sure you're not missing any obvious fractures at all. Um, down in the lower right is an axillary lateral. It's a very important review uh, image to get when you're, um, especially in the ER, when you've done a reduction to make sure that you do have a good reduction. Um, so those are his x-rays. And then we'll move on. This is um, his MRI, but kind of a typical anterior shoulder instability MRI. Um, for those of you who may probably not as familiar looking at MRIs, it's an axial image on the upper left. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but um, the anterior labrum is torn off. You can see dye kind of percolating in underneath the anterior labrum. Posterior labrum looks okay, maybe a little bit of signal in the posterior labrum. Um, his rotator cuff superiorly in that middle image looks okay. He does have this kind of divot in that center image that you'll see. And then the image on the right, and that's a, a hill sax lesion, a little bit of an atypical location for one, but um, hill sax lesion, which is kind of impaction of the bone when the shoulder dislocates out the front. And so this is kind of the, the person I want you to be thinking about, or the patient wants you to be thinking about. Um, there's kind of a, a number of questions that we think about when we see a patient with shoulder instability. First question is, um, do they need surgery or not? And um, surgery isn't always the answer for every patient with shoulder instability. Um, if they do need surgery, when do they need it? Do they need it now? Are they able to finish their season? Um, or can we wait for another dislocation? And, and so trying to decide not only if they need it, but when they need it is important. Um, and then if you do decide surgery, what surgery do you need to do? Not, not, there's a number of different surgeries for shoulder instability, and so part of it is deciding what we need to do. And then um, thinking about any future impact that shoulder instability might have on their shoulder. Um, so a little summary of the rest of the talk. We'll talk about clinical significance. I tried to just do one or two slides for each of these. Bonus points to anyone that can tell me what the name of that uh, position of the shoulder is on the right-hand side there. It's a patient of mine who was wakeboarding and his arm got stuck in that position. 
Um, so then uh, anatomy and biomechanics, uh, clinical evaluation, um, talk a little bit about imaging. We'll go into a little bit more of that during the cases and then um, get into kind of different management options for patients and an algorithm for treating them and then outcomes and then we'll do cases. Um, so first, clinical significance. Um, shoulder dislocations are very common. They occur in 2% of the population. Um, they, they seem to occur in much more frequency when you run a sports medicine clinic. We get a lot of patients coming in, both young and old with shoulder instability. Maybe a little less right now just because people aren't participating at, uh, at quite a high level of sports, but um, that's starting to turn around, so we'll see some more shoulder instability soon. Um, probably the most concerning thing about shoulder instability is that it, it tends to recur. And so if you look at across all age groups, um, recurrence rates probably approach 50%. Um, there are a number of risk factors for um, having a higher rate of recurrent instability. Um, younger age is probably one of the biggest um, uh, risk factors. And so um, it approaches 100% recurrent instability rate the younger you go. And so younger patients were certainly tending to be a little more aggressive about surgical stabilization when we know that they have almost 100% chance of, of recurrent instability. Um, and, and then it tends to affect a highly productive age group. So in men, it's, it's young, young patients between 18 and 30. And then we see a, a second peak in women in their older ages. And those are going to be associated with rotator cuff tears. Um, so no good medical student lecture if you don't talk a little bit about anatomy. Um, and so there's both static and dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder. Um, these are very frequently tested, so important to remember. And they make for really good questions in the operating room. So it's a little disappointing that we don't get you all here so that we can ask these questions. But at least we can talk about them tonight. Um, and so the glenohumeral ligaments are important static stabilizers. They, they each are, are kind of tensioned and provide stability in a different location. So first is the superior glenohumeral ligament. I remember one of my co-residents always taught me to um, think about a shirt and where it's tight and what position the arm is in when that shirt is tight. And so um, the superior glenohumeral ligament is, um, it provides stabilization for the shoulder when the arm is adducted at your side. If you think about a shirt, that's where the top shirt is tight. Uh, Axiosa, the coracohumeral ligament, coracohumeral ligament. Middle glenohumeral ligament provides stability when the, sh the shoulder is abducted, externally rotated at 45 degrees for each of those. Um, and then finally, you also have the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, which is in your 90 degrees of abduction and external rotation. Other static stabilizers include the labrum, which we really focus on for repair. But remember that the labrum also serves as the attachment point for all those glenohumeral ligaments. And so when we're repairing the labrum, we're not just repairing the labrum down to bone, we're also tensioning the glenohumeral ligaments. And then also the bony architecture of the glenoid. Dynamic stabilizers are also important if you think about a patient who has a, like our, our high school athlete we just talked about who has a shoulder dislocation. When he's walking around and going to his high school classes, his shoulder isn't just dislocating at all times. And so there's a number of other things that stabilize the shoulder other than the labrum and the, the ligaments. The rotator cuff probably being the most important of those. And so um, for patients that you're attempting to manage non-operatively that have shoulder instability or that you're helping recover after surgery, rehabilitation of the rotator cuff is very important. A number of other dynamic stabilizers, including the PEC and then all of the scapular stabilizers, and then the deltoid provides a compressive force. Um, so when someone dislocates their shoulder, remember we're talking about anterior shoulder instability. Um, the, the essential lesion as described by Bankart, and I put his middle name there just to make um, Dr. Gwathmi happy. Um, the essential lesion as described by Bankart is, is the labral tear out the front. So the shoulder dislocates out the front. And this is from his original paper where the labrum kind of peels off um, and brings the glenohumeral ligands with it. They also can see some capsular stretch posteriorly. That picture in the upper right is an old arthroscopic image that shows the glenoid on the right, the humeral head on the left, and then a labral tear there in the front. Um, and so then talking about clinical exam, um, probably one of the most important things for me in taking care of patients with shoulder instability um, is physical exam. Not only physical exam in the office, but if we do end up taking them in the operating room, it's a good clinical exam under anesthesia to understand their instability a little better. Very, very important to use the contralateral shoulder as a control. Certainly if you have a patient who's had bilateral shoulder instability, that's a little less valuable. Um, but the first thing I'll always do for an instability patient is examine the other shoulder because that shoulder typically doesn't hurt in the office. You can also learn a lot about whether they have any generalized ligamentous laxity, understand kind of what their normal is before um, inspecting and examining the other side. Um, although I'd, I'd like to say I do it every time, it's to, I, I don't do it routinely, but I certainly do it frequently. Um, visual inspection is very important. So removing the shirt, having them examine the shoulder from behind, examine them moving their shoulders so you can look for any muscle atrophy or scapular dyskinesis, which can be associated with these with, with shoulder instability. Like I mentioned, looking for um, signs of generalized laxity is important. Um, there's a Baton score kind of demonstrated there in the bottom right. 
Um, but patients who have you know, underlying laxity um, can have instability at baseline. And so it may not all be a traumatic dislocation and you're gonna manage that patient completely different than a patient who has a traumatic uni unidirectional instability. Um, after a dislocation, a neurovascular assessment is very important. And so every single patient, I will assess the status of their axillary nerve. You'd actually be surprised how many patients you'll find a little patch of numbness. Um, that's just important to note, certainly so you don't get blamed for it after surgery, but it's important to make sure that their axillary nerve is recovered um, or is recovering before you attempt any surgery. Then look for the range of motion and assess their strength. Strengths could be even more important in your older patient that has a shoulder instability episode because um, you're worried more about rotator cuff tearing in those patients. Then a number of other assessments we look at. Um, so first is apprehension. Apprehension, this kind of picture shows it well here. You abduct, externally rotate them, and then force their humerus forward, and they should describe a feeling of kind of pain or uneasiness about the shoulder, and that would be apprehension. Um, there's a number of different ways of doing load and shift. Most of the pictures, like this one here, is a little different than how, how I do it, but the goal is to actually load the shoulder joint and then try to shift it either anteriorly or posteriorly. I typically abduct the shoulder a little bit more and load it when I'm doing that exam, but um, the goal is still the same, to, to load the shoulder joint and then shift it in the direction that you're expecting for instability. Probably one of my favorite exams for anterior instability is a relocation test. And so you have the patient lay supine and then slide them all the way over so their, their butt and their shoulder is just about hanging off the bed. You can really abduct and externally rotate and lever their humerus forward and get them to have apprehension. And then a positive relocation test would be putting your hand in their axilla while you're doing that and forcing their humerus backwards and that should resolve their, their symptoms of apprehension and pain. Um, talk briefly about imaging. We can get into imaging in a little more detail um, when we're going in with the cases, but like I mentioned before, plain radiographs are important and you wanna get an axillary review all the time. Um, mainly, especially in the ER, to make sure that you have a good reduction. It's very easy to miss a, a posterior dislocation, and so an axillary view is going to confirm the reduction. You also can see things like the x-ray in the upper right where there's a small glenoid fracture, or actually a pretty sizable glenoid fracture on that one. The gold standard for evaluating for labral tearing after instability is, is an MR arthrogram. So that's an image there showing a very nice MR arthrogram of actually both anterior and posterior labral tears. And there are certainly some institutions around the country where the, the arthrogram portion of it may not be as um, you know, deemed as important, but it's very helpful for delineating labral tears, particularly as you get further out in the community and the, the quality of the MRIs go down. Also allows you to look for other soft tissue injuries. So in addition to the labrum, you can also look at the rotator cuff. Remember for older patients who have shoulder dislocations, particularly above the age of 50, we're worried in particular about the rotator cuff more than the labrum, and so you want to be assessing the rotator cuff on, on all of those patients. You can also look for avulsions of the glenohumeral ligaments, or Hegel as it's called. You see that on a coronal MRI. We could talk about that a little bit during the case as well. Also, another other, a number of other subtle things you can look for, atrophy of muscles, edema in the tissues, um, evidence of a recent dislocation event with edema in the hill sacs lesion, um, the final thing is capsular volume. So in a patient who gets an MRI where you're worried about perhaps multidirectional instability or underlying ligamentous laxity, um, you can look for the actual volume, how much space is filled up by that dye. And you'll see very capacious capsules in a lot of people with multidirectional instability. Um, for patients that you're worried about significant bone loss, a CT scan can be very helpful. It's more accurate in characterizing the actual degree of bone loss. It can also help with surgical planning if you're uh, thinking about a procedure other than an arthroscopic label repair, or if you're on the fence on what procedure you should do. Um, and so then we talk about management. And so the non-operative management, um, there are certainly some patients that can be considered uh, for non-operative management. Um, at least traditionally, the management of a first-time dislocation is conservative. And I think there's still a lot of patients that are managed non-operatively. Um, but more and more, what we like to think about it is risk and what patients are at high risk for subsequent dislocation. You never know which dislocation is gonna be the big one that causes significant amount of chondral di uh, damage or, or a, a fracture of the glenoid. Um, and, and so the, the younger the patient is, if they participate in contact sports, um, you, know, you may shy away from you know, non-operative management of them, but certainly a lot of first-time dislocators without significant risk factors can be managed non-operatively. The other people that we might consider for non-operative management would at least initially would be an in-season athlete. And so say you're in your second football game of the season for those um, college football teams that still play and you have a, a, a division one football player that has a, um, a dislocation. Um, that's someone who, you know, if their MRI otherwise looks good, you're not worried about anything else. Um, recognize that they may have some subluxation events during the season, but brace them and try to get them through the season and then plan to manage it with surgery after the season. 
Um, certainly a lot of shoulder instability does end up requiring surgery. And so then the question becomes, what surgery do we do? We have a no number of options. I'll talk about each of them individually, but they include arthroscopic repair, open repair. So actually making incision going down, repairing it while staring at it. And then finally, bony augmentation procedures. Um, so the principles of most of the surgery are the same. And so in general, we're trying to restore anatomy, except when we're talking about the bony augmentation procedures. We're trying to tighten things that are stretched out and repair things that are ripped off. Um, that's to kind of normalize the forces, forces that are around the glenoid. Um, and, um, you know, for bony procedures, if there are a small amount of bony fragments, you want to restore that arc of the glenoid. Um, and some of the procedures that we won't get into a ton of depth about, but we're trying to prevent that hill sex lesion from engaging. And so when you have really large hill sex lesions, engagement means when it kind of the, the shoulder rotates and that defect in the humerus actually engages with the anterior glenoid. And so a lot of the surgery we're doing are trying to prevent that from happening because that uh, will increase their risk of recurrent instability. And we want them to regain the range of motion. So with the surgery we're doing, we're going to prevent instability, but we also want them to regain the use of their shoulder. And then we're trying to prevent arthritis. A lot of the more traditional procedures, kind of older procedures, where they really tighten the shoulders up and prevented instability. Um, Dr. Brockmeyer and I now have the privilege of doing shoulder replacements on a lot of them. And so um, we, we've learned over time on how to reduce instability, but hopefully um, you know, also reduce the incidence of arthritis in the future. Um, so probably the most common surgery that we do for instability is arthroscopic repair. Um, and certainly across the United States, it's, it's the most common. Um, the nice thing about it is you have a scope in the shoulder so you can look around the entire shoulder if you identify anything else, problems with the biceps, problems with the rotator cuff. Um, you can address these at the same time. MRI is not a perfect exam, and so diagnostic arthroscopy can be very helpful. Um, uh, patients in the United States certainly like the, the idea of an arthroscopic operation. There's small poke holes in the shoulder. It's uh, significantly less pain, um, you know, not necessarily a quicker return to sports, but the initial recovery is often a little bit quicker. Um, there is a recurrence rate associated with this, and probably of all the operations that we do for shoulder instability, your highest recurrence rate is going to be with arthroscopic management. Certainly patients that you worry about doing an arthroscopic surgery for, and those are your patients, in particular the one I highlighted below, and that's going to be patients with significant bone loss. Significant bone loss is a moving target. 20% um, used to be a good number, um, probably getting closer on the side of 15%, but um, at least for your guys' level, understanding that patients with bone loss off the glenoid, um, you're worried about a higher recurrence rate, and so you lean towards doing a more invasive operation if they have more bone loss. Um, but an arthroscopic operation is nice and straightforward to do. You can repair the labrum. Um, in general, you're keeping them in a sling for six weeks afterwards, and you're still looking at four to five months until they get back to sports. Um, for some of these patients that are of a higher risk of recurrent instability, um, a more traditional procedure, such as an, an open capsular shift, is indicated. Um, this has a much lower recurrence rate. There still is a recurrence rate associated with it, um, but tends to be a more powerful operation. Not all of us here do them. Um, I, I, I think certainly historically, you know, Dr. Miller, Dr. Brockmeyer have done them, but um, certainly if you come here, you'll see some, some open capsular shifts. Um, it's a very powerful operation. You can not only repair the capsule and the labrum down to the glenoid, um, but you can shift the capsule on the humeral side as well, so you can really tighten patients up. Um, certainly, the, a lot of surgeons go through training not doing many of these, and so it's falling out of favor a little bit. This is a great operation for people with intermediate bone loss and certainly in contact athletes um, with a lower recurrence rate. The worry for these is that you over-tighten them. I haven't sat, found that in my practice, but certainly it's been reported. And then you do have to violate the subscap or the anterior rotator cuff to get in while you're doing the surgery. So a, a, a slight risk of rotator cuff uh, problems. The final options are, are kind of bony operations. So um, certainly revision instability. So patients who have failed and otherwise well done arthroscopic operation um, are often indicated for bony procedures. And then patients with significant bone loss. So loss of more, certainly more than 20% of your anterior glenoid um, bone than you would consider a bony transfer procedure. Um, typically, what we do here is a, a ladder J. Um, you get a bigger piece of bone when you put it on there. Um, that lengthens the amount of distance. If you think about jump distance in a hip, lengthens the amount of distance before the, the um, uh, hill sacs lesion would engage. It also provides, if you look at that nice blue tendon sitting at the bottom of that, that's your, your conjoint tendon. So it provides you with a sling. And so not only does it provide you with restoring the bone, but a sling to help hold the shoulder in place. Um, this is a, a, an x-ray of one of the latter jays I've done. And so this is one of uh, JMU's football players. But 
Um, he actually had a, a, what I thought was a well done arthroscopic operation that failed pretty quickly after he went back to playing sports. He's a high risk kid. Um, and so now he has a ladder J and he's just waiting for football to start up again, but healed pretty well and he's happy with it. Um, so just to conclude this part of it, um, uh, first is that children's stability is a, it's a growing topic and I could talk an hour about each of the things that we talked about. This was just a, a, a picture I took from PubMed. They kind of provide these now, but this is number of papers per year just for shoulder instability. You can see over the past decade, you're looking at 500 papers a year. And so it's a topic that's exploding and research in general is exploding, but shoulder instability is certainly exploding. And so um, this was really just meant to kind of touch the surface a little bit. Also remember that not all unstable shoulders are created equal. So not just patient size, but patient activities, what they're trying to get back to. And so um, you don't want to just have um, kind of one way to treat them all. You need to think about the patient in general and their activities and individualize your treatment for their problem. One of the biggest ways to individualize treatment is to assess risk. And so um, some patients may be okay for non-operative management. Other ones may need surgery right away. And then the surgery you do, it's all about trying to reduce the risk of a, a, a second instability event. One of the biggest people we worry about are, are younger patients. So when you get patients who are in their teens, they're at a very high risk for recurrent instability. That was that number I showed you, 80, 90% risk of recurrent instability if you get a young enough age. And so um, while there are some of them that do get managed non-operatively, increasingly more and more, um, we're considering stabilizing them early. Um, and then beware of the activities your patient's trying to go back to. Um, doing a shoulder instability surgery on a 30-year-old guy who's just a, a surgeon who doesn't do much anymore as compared to uh, doing a, a surgery on a, a, a 20 year old football player who has three years of eligibility left. Those are two different patients. And so making sure that the, uh, um, the surgery that you're doing is appropriate for their level activity is right. Um, remembering the glenoid is really important. And so um, this is just showing the inverted pair is a, um, a term for the glenoid that, that's missing a lot of bone loss in the front. But I need to respect the glenoid and understand that um, bone loss is a, is a reason to consider more of a surgery up front or certainly to warn the patient that they, they have a higher risk of insta recurrent instability if you do it arthroscopically. And make sure you're choosing the right, uh, the right surgery for the patient. So um, you know, there's a lot of different surgery we can do, but again, choose the right thing for them. Um, and have a good backup plan. I mean, so I, I warn every single patient that I do a shoulder instability surgery for, particularly arthroscopically. There's a good chance this works, but um, you know, 90% 90, 90 chance is really good, but that means one out of 10 shoulder instability operations that I do um, is gonna have a recurrent instability event. And so I'm very upfront about that. And so that if a patient has that happen, um, it's not necessarily something that I did wrong or something that patient did wrong. Um, we just need to make sure that when we do it the next time that we do something different or do something better so that they get a stable shoulder out of it. That's it, thanks for visiting. Awesome, Brian. That was an awesome overview. The, the shoulder instability is like one of the, our favorite things we deal with because there's just so much great anatomy and just the mechanics of it are really interesting. And it's, it's a good surgery. Patients tend to do well. There is a recurrence risk, as Brian alluded to. Um, trying to figure out the right operation for the right patient is always challenging. Um, but certainly, it's been one of those things where we've seen some great evolution as far as our techniques and uh, uh, suture anchors and labral management. It's been one of the one of the cool things about orthopedics. All right, so here's what we're going to do now, okay? And this is going to be kind of awkward because uh, if you guys were here, it'd be a lot easier for us to kind of like manage how we organize this, okay? But uh, what my chief president, Trent Gauss, uh, who's on sports right now, is putting together a couple of cases. And what we're going to do is we're going to divide up into small groups based on each faculty member, okay? I sent out assignments earlier today as far as where you would go. Uh, sadly, you know, there's some people who dro sort of dropped out. So if, if you're not in the room that I told you to be assigned to, it'll be okay. You'll, you'll be okay. I promise you that. Okay. So if the residents, I think I, I texted each one of you to be leading a room. So James, you're going to be leading Dr. Brockmeyer's room. Zach, you're going to be running Dr. Deduck's room. Tim, you're with me. Uh, so in Dr. Miller's room, it's going to be Neil Blanchard in the show, uh, and then Dr. Warner's room will be Alyssa Altoff, and then Dr. Bachman's room, Dave Weiss will be running the show. Actually, no, Trent Gauss. Uh, but Dave Weiss might be in there, which would be kind of fun. Yeah, put, put Weiss with me. <laughs> so Weiss and Bachman are going to be the pseudo sports attending for the evening, okay? So we'll do this for about 20 minutes or so, about 8.50 or so. I'll close the rooms, and uh, what you'll see is you'll see it start to click down. So be prepared to be interactive, uh, be prepared to introduce yourself and have some fun, okay? So here goes nothing. I hope this works. So much torture. And by torture, I mean, sorry that they got stuck with the peds guy.
Dude, kids dislocate their shoulders a lot. I, mean, I know. I send them all to you. Yeah, and I, and I love it. It's so much fun doing them twice. Um, the I think the creepiest thing is is your background and your face, just like the 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 alignment of everything, the dress clothes at the well, booth, all that kind of stuff. No, enough banter. Yeah. Everybody's back, okay? They're all listening to an Eve show. I know it's great. I think it's hilarious. Seeing into the dark place that is your basement. All right. So um, I hope that was. Is that good? Any questions for Dr. Werner? Good looking repair, Brian. Thanks. All right, so Tim, we're gonna go right into the, your, your tour of the hospital. And I hope you show all the constructions being done right now because it's a, it's a lot of fun getting around. <laughs> uh, skip some of the construction shots, but um, you'll, uh, you'll certainly get the idea. Um, so welcome again to everybody. We'll jump into the, uh, we'll jump into the tour, the virtual tour. So I'll share my screen. All right, everyone can see me and hear me okay? Can see great, buddy. Awesome. All right, so um, this is a quick tour of the UVA Medical Center and some of our uh, associated facilities, the um, Outpatient Surgery Center, and then a quick look at our clinics at Fontaine. Um, quick shot of, uh, of um, grounds. This is the famous rotunda and the lawn. Um, and I show this because the hospital is just off screen to the left. So you can get an idea for how close we are to the uh, UVA grounds, to the corner, and uh, to the university. One more quick shot of Charlottesville, and uh, we've got another talk on everything to do outside of the hospital, but this is about five minutes from the hospital. And so if you're like me and you live five minutes away, you pass by this area on your way to work. So this is my morning commute in. It takes a total of five minutes. And then here's the hospital. So um, this big white building in the center is the main hospital. And off to the left is our new addition. Um, this tower is the uh, newly opened wing of the hospital, which has our uh, brand new ED open less than a year ago, um, as well as new operating rooms and soon to be a new uh, inpatient orthopedic floor, currently being taken from us by COVID. Um, but when that changes, we'll have a, a brand new orthopedic inpatient floor with, with private rooms. So that's something to look forward to. Um, just a reminder of where we are here in Charlottesville, a couple hours from DC, and just an hour from Richmond. So uh, zoom in, and uh, we'll get back to the virtual tour. Talked about I'll talk about the main hospital, go through a couple places that we frequent, and then a quick mention about Battle Building, Battle Building, um, our outpatient surgery center, and then uh, Fontaine, where we have our clinical space. So here's another shot of the main hospital. Um, this is the front entrance. And there's the new wing. So beautiful new addition that, like I said, is, is less than a year uh, in operation. And um, so you'll spend a lot of time there uh, doing consults in the ED. This is a view from the first floor of the emergency department. Um, to get on with the virtual tour, this is uh, being on my drive into work. So I'll come around the back of the hospital. This is the ambulance loading bay. And then it takes you to the garage. And I show the South Garage parking lot just because this gives you an idea for how convenient it can be. Just a quick walk down this brick road and you're at the, uh, at the hospital here where you can head straight to the call room. Um, so our call rooms are uh, down in the basement. We've got a scrub machine there. So you get in, change. And then this is a look at what our call rooms look like. So this is the uh, junior call room. And our particular our second year residents, PGY2s, will spend a lot of time here. So this is sort of your uh, home base for your night flow rotation. Um, you can see we've got it set up with computers. This is artwork uh, with the skull, I think, by Ian Backland and the rest by uh, Matt Deasy's daughter, Maggie. Um, so this is the uh, junior resident call space. And then we've got another workroom for the senior resident on nights. And you drew that rainbow. I remember you doing that. <laughs> trying to pass it off. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the gym down in the call room area. Um, photo taken by Ian Backland looking big. Um, but this is just a kind of, it's a small gym, but it's got everything you need. Um, free weights, bench press, pull up bar. Um, also frequented by the night team. So this takes up the six East. Um, six East is our, our inpatient orthopedic floor. Um, so this is where you'll spend time as an intern, taking care of the post-op patients, um, learning how to manage the floor in orthopedics. This is Leo, one of our nurses up on six East. 
and a quick look into the Six East workroom um, where Pat is hanging out, one of our uh, NPs, famous for sort of helping us survive intern year on the floor and learn how to treat our post-operative patients. Um, continuing the tour, so this is the this is the SICU look on the um, the surgical ICU. You'll spend time here in your intern year when you do a SICU rotation, and then a lot of time here when you're on your ortho trauma block as well as your uh, ortho spine rotation. Um, so they do a really good job taking care of our post op patients, poly trauma patients, um, serious spinal cord injuries. Um, so you'll get familiar with the SICU as well. Um, this is something I wanted to highlight. This is our anatomy lab. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is an awesome part of our residency program. So this is, um, is a really great space. We do um, dissections probably every other month. And then more frequently than that, if you include the uh, industry sponsored events as well. So we'll, um, through, our, uh, through our curriculum, we'll do at least once a block uh, dissections where we'll you know, lately zoom in, but usually in person come and uh, check out a dissection and and learn from the anatomy. Um, the nice thing about this area is that it's kind of set up to simulate an operating room. So you can see it's got the OR style overhead lights. Um, you've got monitors and we can set up arthroscopy towers in this area. And then in the back, you can see we've got a mini C-arm back here. So you can set up the whole OR experience with overhead lights. You get your, your sets ready and then you can really kind of simulate walking through a procedure and have uh, x-ray ready, take your shots. So. This is a, a great place for learning in kind of a low stress way. Um, we had a shoulder scope lab here a couple days ago. And so this is something we make a lot of use of. Um, another picture of our lab space here. And then one more shot. Usually we can have about three or four tables running at a time. So we have good access to this space and, and make good use of it. Um, so this is a look at the main OR. This is at the main hospital. and. Obviously the bulk of your time is spent here. Quick look into one of the operating rooms. Um, so plenty of space and uh, obviously on your, on your more inpatient heavy rotations, trauma, spine, joints, you'll spend a lot of time at the main OR. A look into our PACU. And then the tour uh, takes us through the, the main lobby of the hospital. So this is the main entrance. Um, you may walk through here on your way to the cafeteria. Um, this is our cafeteria, which is actually pretty good. Um, you know, market, uh, market, del mid to order deli sandwiches, et cetera. It is open until three in the morning. Um, so for uh, the night float residents, there's stuff available. And our cafeteria and the higher grounds where you can get your coffee and practice your Spanish in the morning if you're so inclined. Um, you may need to fuel up before coming to the emergency department. So this is, uh, this is our new ED. And so really, really nice space. It's been open for less than a year now, brand new emergency room, um, which we really needed. Um, and now it's a, uh, it's a 70 bed emergency department, all, um, all private rooms. Um, obviously we're level one trauma center and it's got four brand new trauma bays um, that handle the, uh, the acute traumas that come in. So you'll spend a lot of time here, especially second year when you're taking, when you're taking consults. So here's a look inside of our ED. Um, this is what you'll see when you're seeing consults down in the ED. Um, there's an example of one of the patient rooms to the right. Um, and the nice thing is all these patient rooms are, are really big. So you've got plenty of room to bring in your C-arm, um, do your reduction and splinting. Um, you're not, you're not kind of cramming into a small space. So that is convenient. Um, this is a look into one of the trauma bays. So, um, like I said, there, there are four brand new trauma bays. They're all really big like this. They've got kind of OR style overhead lighting, overhead x-ray. So they're pretty good about taking their, their trauma x-rays before the patient rolls to CT. And uh, plenty of room in here and plenty of help to get your uh, kind of trauma procedures done, whether you're doing a traction pin or reduction, splinting. Um, so you'll spend time in these trauma bays as well. Um, they in theory, try to make things convenient for us and uh, have ortho things available in ortho cart. So actually sometimes you'll get lucky and get a consult and come down, they've rolled the ortho cart for you. So this has everything you need for splinting and casting. And so this will be outside the room. One more look at the ED. And then uh, this is our, uh, this is the battle building. So um, this is a really nice uh, and beautiful building exteriorly. And then 
What's housed in the battle building is the uh, pediatric ortho clinic, as well as our outpatient surgery center, um, which is located in the basement. And uh, so the outpatient surgery center, OPSI, is where you'll spend a lot of time on, on your sports rotation, on your hand, foot and ankle, and a little bit of time on your peds ortho rotation. Um, the outpatient surgery center is really nice, you know, it has more of an outpatient feel, um, faster turnover, and uh, so you can get a lot of cases done uh, in a smaller amount of time. This is a look walking actually from the main hospital, the flyover walkway to the outpatient surgery center. So walking this way, and this glass building is the UVA outpatient pharmacy, as well as the uh, graduate, med graduate medical education office where you can get a uh, free cold brew coffee anytime you're walking by. This is Neil Blanchard posing for a picture uh, at the outpatient surgery center, looking sharp. Um, so when you've made it over to this area, if you head down to the basement, uh, you'll find the ORs. And then if you head up to the fourth floor, that'll take you to the pediatric ortho um, clinic. A view from battle building. So you can see how close we are to, to uh, the UVA campus. And this is Main Street below and one of the rooftop bars nearby the graduate, you can see with the lights up over there. So a quick look into uh, the outpatient surgery center. Here's the one of the workspaces, the pre-op area. Uh, this is where anesthesia will delay your cases by um, doing your blocks late in the morning. Um, so we stay on them about that. But in general, things actually run really smoothly at the outpatient surgery center. So things are fast, uh, things are routine, and um, it's, a, it's a great place to be. I'm, I'm here all the time now because I'm on my sports rotation. Um, and so they really crank through cases. Um, they've got 12 outpatient surgery center ORs here. And here's a look into one of those. So all these rooms are um, set up with arthroscopy towers. Um, so on, you know, on your sports rotation, doing a lot of scoping and uh, all the staff is very familiar. So things tend to flow pretty smoothly. Dr. Wapney and co. Is, uh, I think this was something posted uh, on Twitter for a selfie selfie day. And so this is the, uh, the crew at the outpatient surgery center. And then uh, lastly, just a couple words about Fontaine Research Park. So this is home to our administrative offices, um, conference rooms, and all of, our, uh, all of our outpatient clinics. So go ahead here, um, usually once or twice a week for, for clinic. And it's a quick five minute drive from the hospital. So it's super convenient. Um, this is an example of one of our clinic buildings. This is the uh, building that houses the hand center and the spine center. Um, and actually from a patient standpoint, this is a really, really great place to go for your care because this is kind of an, uh, a comprehensive care center. It's not just the orthopedic clinic in here, but they've got therapy services. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, radiology also located in here. Um, so you can actually get your imaging done, go to your ortho clinic appointment, and then go to therapy, everything all in one place. So that's one of the uh, standout things about the, the hand center and our uh, clinical buildings at Fontaine. Um, a quick word about Ivy Mountain, the uh, upcoming musculoskeletal center um, scheduled to open in 2022. We've got another talk dedicated to this, so I just wanted to mention it. Um, but a lot of our outpatient procedures are gonna be moving here this is an artist rendering of what it's gonna look like. Um, but we've already broken ground. There's Dr. Chabra. Um, and uh, you can see that we've actually made a lot of progress already. So it's up and coming, it's gonna be a reality. And uh, this is gonna be an awesome addition to the UVA facilities when that comes into, uh, comes into our program in, in two years. So we're excited for it. Um, it's kind of a whirlwind tour, but that, that wraps up the uh, tour of the hospital and facilities. So. Welcome to ask me any questions about, about the hospital and medical center or just about, about the program in general. Here's a shot of our residents, myself not included. Tim rocks some knee scopes cases today. Good job, Tim. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Miller. A good shot from Miller. Miller, do you, do you recognize any of his locations? <laughs> yes, I, yes, I do, except for the ER. <laughs> you don't want to hear Dr. Miller in the ER, I can tell you that. That's, that's, a, that's a promise. Any questions from anybody? I know it's, we're getting kind of late here. I told you guys it only lasts an hour or 9.06, and I'm very cognizant of your time. But I'm very flattered you guys would spend you know, an hour with us every Thursday night. You know, we're going to be doing this for you know, seven more weeks. And so um, you know, I, I hope you guys can see the investment our program puts into this. Our residents are always here. 
our uh, faculty are always here. So um, I hope you guys continue to join us. Um, you know, real quick, just to kind of show you guys what's going from here. Um, I think you can see my screen. So next week we're gonna be talking about total hip arthroplasty. So Dr. Kui from the joint rotation is gonna do that with us. And then Thomas Moran, we talk about resident rotations in the curriculum. So that will be next week, okay? So without uh, any, if there are any other questions, please email me or you know reach out to, to me if you had somebody in your room you wanna reach out to one of the residents. There will be opportunities going forward for you guys to have um, small groups with our residents uh, so that you can you know ask questions kind of in a more small group informal setting okay so just know that we will we will try to do that as much as we can for you guys going forward all right so without without uh with, with that i am going to say thank you for being here uh brian werner thank you for a great talk tim lancaster thank you for a great talk trent trent put his info just now into the uh into the um chat um, so he, he put his email address and his cell phone number if you have any questions for Trent either. We'll get you guys in touch with all of our residents at some point. So, um, so I will talk to you guys next week. All right. So looking forward to total joints. Y'all have a nice night. All right. Touchdown OBJ. Go Brownies. Are they playing tonight against the Bengals? Yeah. I went two? The Bengals. Uh, no, two and oh, they're up 14 to three already in the, just beginning the second quarter. Oh, Baker yeah. just threw a 43-yard bomb, bomb to OBJ. All right, guys. See you next time.